Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as you men Bjorn mentioned, I come from a very different background. Um, I'm neither an artist or musician. Um, but I was brought into Lille Galerie. It's now 10 years old, so it's time for a kind of re-evaluation and looking at how to take it further. So I think that's why they brought an economist in and someone who's worked very much with production and workflow processes, things that sound maybe a bit boring, but I think are very important to the institutional foundations. Um, I've also done a curatorial master's course at the Academy in Bergen, and um, there my focus, and it still is, is very much how um, we affect and negotiate systems in the art world and art market, how we legitimize, mediate, and diffuse um, in spe specifically art a bit on periphery on the outside. So personally, I'm very attracted to the idea of sound art, which is so elusive and slippery and hard to define. Um, I think it's quite good to be a neutral listener in a situation like Lille Galleria. Um, I don't have a particular agenda, so I can listen to both sides of the arguments and my role there is very much to mediate new opportunities and focus on what Anna said about what sound art can do, not so much what it is. Um, so today I'll quite concisely talk a bit about how we do what we do. Um, Lille Galeria, like a lot of um, great art projects, started off as a passion project. It was a love child born out of a collective of writers, academics, musicians and visual artists back in 2005. They all got together because they were curious about exploring the sonic medium. Um, I also have to note here that there's one person in particular that's really driven Lille Galeria forward. His name is Jürgen Larsen, and he's worked a lot with uh, Carsten Serpo. So I think their strategy to begin with was really focusing on, from the visual arts, uh, site-specific and sculptural-based sound art. And that was a very important strategy. Um, I think something for us institutions, we're very affected the context of what's happening in cultural policy and funding opportunities. Um, the visual arts funding pot is much larger in, in Norway. So it was a natural place to go and establish this type of institution through the visual arts um, kind of funding bodies. And that's something that happened very early on. Ligali is supported both by the local Filke, our local council, uh, commune, and the no uh, Norwegian Arts Council. And they funded us from day one and still continue to work with us quite closely, not just by giving us money, but we have uh, regular meetings and strategy workshops with them. So it's a two-way conversation uh, that we have with them. Um, here are some posters um, which shows the vast kind of breadth of um, projects that have taken place. You'll see a lot of them are quite international, and I think that's the nature of the development of sound art. It's a small sector, but it's very north, it's very European. Um, and you'll see in our program, we're now moving more to Scandinavian and Norwegian productions. It, there's a natural progression there in terms of the, the local field. Um, and also, you're talking, Seth, about financial institutional constraints, budget-wise. It's a little bit cheaper to produce locally than internationally, but it's something we're working on with new strategies, which I'll tell you about a bit later. Let's see. Yeah, and this whole thing about um, this unruly child that we work with, and I think my job, I feel often as a parent, I'm trying to take care of this unruly child uh, and find situations to make it kind of flourish. Uh, you talk about artists that, um, you know, just send their work out there and hope that it's going to behave and work. So I think that's a really important kind of standpoint to think about. And that's really why uh, this collective decided to invest in a permanent space. It was really important to have a, a room where you could customize and think about acoustics and different needs. Um, Traditionally, uh, the idea of a concert hall or a gallery space, the traditional gallery space, don't always accommodate all the formats and ways in which sound practitioners like to work. So it's been, it's been fantastic. Um, Lou Gully has been programming in lots of different public spaces and different sites, but in negotiation with the local arts council, um, they agreed or fund about three million kroners to help 
rehabilitate the building. So this was the building. It was a building that was used for a few years. Carsten, you've done a few projects there, I think. Um, and it was a really, you know, people look back with nostalgia and say, oh, it was great in the old days. We had lots of broom cupboards and wonky floors and we could do much more experimental work, perhaps, they felt. Um, but with all that kind of equipment, you know, it's really important to have um, stable environments, proper storage rooms. It's about professionalizing the whole uh, operations. So that's what it looks like today. Um, here are some of the internal rooms, and what we've built structurally is we have a dedicated um, concert performance space in the second floor. On the top corner, it looks like a black box, but those are molten curtains that can be pushed back, so it's also a white cube if needed. And downstairs, we have a big room, about 100 square meters, and there the walls are always changing <laughs> according to what the specific work needs. So there's a lot of building work going on, still today. So that's normally how I go dressed when I go to work. Uh, I'm always painting and building and fixing and, yeah, when I'm not writing funding applications. Um, for us, I mean, it's also, we, we kind of see sound not so much as an art form, but more as a mode of experience. So that's how we program um, the work that we do at the gallery. Uh, it's very important to think how this work is going to be kind of viewed or consumed by the public. Um, so that's a really important thing that we ask when we bring in new projects. Um, let me see. And in that kind of development, development of um, audiences, we also partner with the Bergen Electronic Music Festival. So we have an audience with average age between 18 to 25, both for our sound art and the music programs that happen there. And that's quite unique, I think, and quite interesting because it also feeds into a lot of the academic institutions. So we work with the um, Architectural Academy, the Greg Music Academy, and the um, Arts Academy. And I think really interesting things happen when we, we educate them as they're studying, and a lot of them come back and produce work with us, um, which we're seeing a lot of. And there's, this is about the environment in which Lead Gully has been able to flourish, and I think there's, it's not a coincidence that it happened in Bergen. We have a really developed contemporary music scene there, and we have a genuine kind of atmosphere of collaboration across the different fields, and that's really fed us, um, and we continue to do so. I have a structural map, uh, which I'll show you a bit. This is, this is um, shows a bit how we actually function. Lead Gully is there in the middle, but we're a part of a much larger ecology. We work with several festivals that program in our building, and we also program off-site with them. So Festival in Bergen, which is the biggest kind of arts festival in Norway, we produce one production for them, often in public spaces. Um, the Echo Music Festival, we program an exhibition for them, and we do two or three concerts within their program. Borealis, the contemporary festival for music, um, they're actually about to come in and join us as owners in the house, so we work very closely together. Um, BEEC, the Centre for Electronic Arts, they're more of a production space, so they don't have a venue for showing a lot of their work, so it, it's natural that they show it with us, but we also co-produce with them and run workshops with them. And the Pixel Festival, which is one of my favourites, it's an open source um, electronics slash music festival, which I think is really interesting. It still has that grassroots, uh, anything goes kind of attitude, um, which is really good. And we also do co-productions, and this is also a way to finance. You know, you, we all don't have the biggest um, production budgets, so by working with other producers, so we produce with the International Foundation 3.14, we do a lot of, um, sound, shower, um, works with them and field recordings. Bergen Kunsthal, we do with large international artists, just to share the costs, especially of transport <laughs> and things like that. Um, of Garden New Music, we do concerts with them. Um, and we're currently developing an exhibitions program for the Electronic Literature Conference. There's a, a big focus kind of on text and art and text and sound, which we're working a lot with. Um, Bit Theater Galation, 
uh, they're an international theater production space and we're working on new ways and different ways for people to encounter sound art. So in a black box theater, thinking about a, a timed and shared experience to very personal installation based um, work. So we often take one production and show it in lots of different formats and rooms. Um, and we're working with Bergen Assembly. I don't know how much you know about the Bergen Triennial, but one third of it is being curated by Tarek Atui. So we're working with him to do a project um, instruments and music for deaf people. So there's a lot of different activities and we're only able to do that because we partner so broadly. Um, and also in terms of how we work, I'm not an artist, but we're an artist around space. Uh, I work with a very active artistic board and the members there also work or are part of the Bergen Electronic Arts Centre, New Music. Th there's a real kind of um, broad influence that goes into the programming and that works with me on a weekly basis. We also have a strong educational program. Um, in Bergen, it's fantastic. The kindergartens are specialized, so we, we work with four um, art kindergartens. So we have kids, you know, three, four years old that come running in going, when's the next exhibition? Which is really, really great. Um, and last but not least, we have I think it's important with the funding partners to spread the risk and to develop different conversations, the different strategies and priorities and, and really focus in on those. That's, that's been key for us. And um, this blue map, that's just in Bergen. So you see there's a lot happening in the arts in Bergen, but also it's very important specifically with the Arts Council that we work nationally. Um, and we see that in Bergen is Artist-run spaces are much more prominent than in Oslo. In Oslo, size really matters, and it's the big <laughs> institutions. Um, but there, we are part of an electronic uh, production network. So we do productions and work very closely and a bit of lobbying with funding with all those nodes over there. Um, and we also do productions or consult other um, organizations like Oka, we were there to help them with the performance part of their um, Rapture show at Venice Biennale. And just a comment about that, Seth, I don't know if you've seen it, but when you talk about the discursive, I think Camille Norman's piece really, really does that very well. It's a piece that could have been overshadowed by the architecture and the site specific from a visual arts point of view, but it goes so far beyond and it's, I re I'd really recommend that piece. I'm uh, not being biased, but it's, I think it's amazing. We're actually doing an exhibition with her next year at Lude Galleria. Um, and for Leaf, for example, we're doing all the technical setup for... Uh, Leaf is at the uh, Lofoten International Arts Festival. So all our equipment is going up there by boat and we're helping them to do the technical setup. So we also have a <coughs> speaker library which we rent out or let other people borrow. So we, s we see that we've, a lot of the knowledge that's being built over the 10 years has kind of changed the way we operate. So instead of being so much a showcasing or presenter, we're more about production, um, research and education. Uh, just a bit about how we finance, who finances what, and you'll see we're almost like 90% public finance, which puts a lot of pressure on us. You know, from a private project, we're now very much a public project. And that means that there are certain things that you have to do and you, you know, educational documentation, the more institutional things that at times we would rather just focus on doing the crazy exploratory projects. Um, and also what we call investment is how we spend our money. Being an artist run space, it, we really try to put as much money into productions and going directly back to the artists. So I think it's quite a big percentage compared to a lot of other institutions. And that's very important for us, um, you know, really considering who we work with, why we're working with them. It's important to ask those questions because we are so privileged to have a space dedicated to sound art. Um, yeah, this is just some, uh, some of the works. Carsten Seffer, this is one that you brought to Lille Galerie, didn't you, Peter Vogel? It was Jürgen, just Jürgen. Ah. But that was, that was, it worked really well. It, we used the whole space for it, both upstairs uh, with this interactive sound wall, 
or a symphony of shadows, that's what it's called. Um, there's a table, you can, you can play the instruments and the shadows move and it was really, both adults and kids, it was, um, it was great. And we tried to create exhibitions that, in Norwegian city, in Middelbach, that you just automatically kind of get absorbed and experienced in, but still allow depths of meaning and other things to be going on. That's really important when we choose to commission a work. And today we work almost only with new commissions and new productions. So that's also changed from before. Um, does anyone want to see one of our projects or how we work? I have a little extract from YouTube, like one minute, and it's just a... This is a project we did for the Borealis Festival with Tomoko Sauvage, a Japanese artist based in Paris. Um, and she did an installation, and this is from the opening, and we find, I don't know if anyone else, openings are really bad for sound works. Uh, they get completely drowned out, so what we do instead is we often do performances or talks or seminars on the, um, at the opening, because it's the one chance as well to kind of communicate and activate the work and um, the themes. So I'm just going to play a minute from her, her piece. And it, this also shows how we work. You know, Tomoko is actually, a, by education, a composer, working now visually, and that really is where, where we want to operate. It's where the musicians and the so-called visual artists meet. We, we find that there's most friction there, and that's the most interesting. Um. So she uses hydrophones um, for both electronic feedback, and there's also acoustic water drops just falling from the ice blocks. building an archive at the moment. Uh, we have, over the last 10 years, about 200 different artists we've worked with, so we have a lot of sounds, videos and texts that we are working on, finding a way to kind of share um, what we're doing kind of in the first instance is we've rebuilt, actually we've done some more rebuilding in the gallery, and we have like a work space, project room, where anyone can come and work. Uh, we have a huge library of books where they yeah, use the internet, come talk to us, just try to activate it. We have record players, people can bring in music, a bit of a show and tell kind of space. So that's how we're first kind of making our archive available, but we think we need to link it digitally in some way. Um, or we, we would de we'll definitely do that. Let's see. <coughs> how am I for time? A few minutes, because cause, cause this project really tells how we work with sound artists. You know, when Tomoko was going to come to Bergen uh, in transportation, all her equipment disappeared. She lost all her hydrophones, her ceramic bowls are broken. It was a nightmare. You know, customs and arts is a real, real hassle. Um, and we had two days to the opening, but it was fantastic because through this network of artists, uh, the Marine Biology Institute and the Min Ministry of Defense, we managed to to get and replace all her equipment, which was great. Um, in terms of maintenance for this type of work, you know, every morning we, we had to order 500 kilos of ice 
that had to come by truck from Oslo to Bergen because it's a particular type of ice. Um, it's sculpture ice, which is, yeah, it's only made in one place. So there's expenses and having to find a room, we can find a freezer, and every morning we would cut these pieces and put them in the nets and hang them up. And as it drops, it has to drop in a specific part of the bowl. So we need to, every hour, move the bowls to get the right clung in the room. And, you know, there's a lot of water that needs to be cleaned so people don't slip. Um, a very labor-intensive but very enjoyable project. We, had, we found that most people came and spent over half an hour in the installation, which is quite unusual. Um, and she actually allowed people to kind of play with the installation. So at the end of the day, a lot of other artists and musicians, we said they could come and test the equipment and, and the system, which was great. Um, and we worked further with Tomoko. And she created a new piece from the broken ceramics, which is great. So, you know, we like to work with artists over time. And as you say, it's a process. There's never a final de you know, destination answer to anything. So we like to work in chapters and series. Um, and we also have an ambisonic music program, because I've talked a lot about concerts, but we specifically work with 3D sound. In the building, we've invested in a 26-channel uh, surround sound audio system, which is quite unique for an art space. So with that, we have four concerts. We create workshops. We have ambisonic um, summer schools, and we commission about five new composition works every year. So we do, yeah, we do, we do these, and we're developing interfaces with NOTAM, both for composers and for some of the young club kids that DJ, so that they can learn how to work with sound and space. Um, so, you know, these kind of events, more, more commercial perhaps, but we also need those in terms of um, running the, the, the whole cultural house. And we have other types of concerts. This was a Peter Leonard's work called um, Micro Dub Sleep, where his aim was to make the most boring, quiet concert possible. And it was a huge success. We had um, about 20 people overnight, and he was playing uh, so uh, soundscapes and field recordings from a city in China, and reading throughout the whole night. Um, we had about eight, eight kind of 18 year olds that thought it was going to be a dub club night. Uh, but they stayed and really enjoyed it. And then we served them breakfast the next day. So those are some of the events we do. And we consider, you know, this whole discussion, what is sound? It's all sound. And, and we're actually doing a strategy workshop and we're looking maybe to redefine what we call ourselves instead of a sound, a house for, sa for sound art and electronic music. We're just thinking of calling ourselves a house for sound. Um, I, should I stop there? I think so. Because those are just some things we're working on. But Lots thank of new you. Projects.